my world famous diagram up on the up on the, up, up on the screen, assuming I have a marker. We have a client. who is connected to the internet. Who makes requests to and gets a responses back from a server. Plain old static web pages, which are web pages that don't change, will be the same for everyone all the time until someone manually goes and changes a web page. The request consists of a URL. All right. And that was great when the web was invented, but we've We've gravitated more to having, instead of websites, web applications. And what do I mean by web applications? I mean stuff that does a lot more than that. Something that would mimic some, mimic some of the functionality of like a desktop or a mainframe app. For example, if I could go to a website and see a restaurant's menu, hours, and the address of it and phone number, that would be a website. If I can go to another restaurant's website and order food from them, see what the daily specials are, get directions, make reservations, that's a web application. There's more functionality involved. So in the simplest case, the request goes to the server and the server responds with what we talked about last time, a web page or an HTML page. And again, knowing that that is actually a package which includes HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and other files. All right. And in the case of HTML, it simply finds a file and f files and sends them. Well, we're not terribly interested in that. What we're interested in is sort of the next step up, which the difference is is the pages aren't out there sitting completing. So instead, we have server-side scripts. And these server-side scripts, you can think of as being more like a recipe for a web page. They're the instructions that are used to create a web page dynamically especially for you, all right? And if you think about it, any sort of web application is going to have something like this, right? If you think of an ordering like application like Amazon or like Domino's Pizza or whatever, you're not giving the same person every order, you know, the same uh, in their order. You're giving them orders based on what they filled in on some form, all right? So the request is typically going to be more complicated. The request... Let me rephrase that. More about the request is relevant than the URL. With static sites, the URL is the only thing that's important. These other things exist on the request for a static page as well. It's just that they're not used. They're not important. But some more things are relevant if you are writing dynamic pages. And those include things like the location, the kind of computer, browser, any form information that you've entered in, and a bunch of other stuff in addition. And again, it's less important to know the details of all this than to just know that with the request a whole bunch of stuff goes over. Form information is critical, right? Because if you think of most web applications, most of them are associated, associated with forms. You know? um, 
Maybe user information is another one, like who I am. So like Angel can display the proper um, pages to each, each student. All of this goes over as part of the request, and all of it is used by the server and the server-side scripts in on the fly making a web page. In the end, the client still gets a web page. They still get this stuff. That's what browsers understand. That's what browsers have to get, all right, in order to work. It's the process by which those web pages are created. In one, they're created in advance by a web developer and put out there. In other cases, the scripts are, are put out there. Now, oftentimes, a server is going to communicate with a database server. Because in, in, in most cases, um, there's some sort of data that's involved in creating that. So like if I did a search, for example, I'd put in a form my search term, a database would be queried to find matches, and that would be used by the server-side script to format and create a web page for the user. If I was placing an order, the information on the form, my user information, my credit card number, and all that would be placed into a database file. All right. This diagram, as it stands out, is fairly generic. In other words, um, this is how all server-side scripting works. This, this diagram ap applies whether you're talking about PHP or whether you're talking about ASP.NET or Perl or Ruby or any of those things. It also applies regardless of what database management system you're talking about. So all we know is there's a, there's a database server out there somewhere. And in fact, the database server could be also the web server. So it could be serving two roles in this case. Any questions about this model? All right. What we want to do today, ultimately, is talk about things specific to ASP.NET because this is a generic model and ASP.NET fits in this model, but it has its own way of doing things. Before we do that, though, it's interesting. I'm reading a book and it talked about price discrimination on the website Orbitz. Is anyone familiar with Orbitz? Yeah, travel website, right. Uh, does anyone know what the term price discrimination means? You probably could take a guess at what it means. Jack the prices up for places they don't like and lower them for places they do. Uh, kind of, but not really. Are they more targeting the customers at their locations? Like maybe people in New York and California, they're charging more for places to Right. Work. Price discrimination is when you charge two different people a different amount. Wait, is that legal? Yeah. Yeah, it's legal as long as it's not, not done based on gender, religion, or race. All right? So, guess what Orbitz did? And you can look it up. Just Google Orbitz price discrimination. Orbitz looked to see, and it would charge 30% higher for hotels if you were a Mac user. The thought being, if you had a Mac, you had some extra money. All right, so I'm going to charge you 30% more. So they took all the aggregated data that they got in throughout all this process. This database isn't just functionality. This database is forming profiles about people. They can do that, and then they can go and uh, charge you extra. That's kind of a scary thought, in a way. Could you imagine going into Burger King, and the person eyed you up and looked to see what, what you were wearing, and based on what you were wearing, said, well, let's see, that person is in a t-shirt and jeans. I'll charge him a dollar for a Big Mac. This guy's in an Armani suit. I'll charge him three dollars for a Big Mac. You wouldn't get a Big Mac at Burger King, right? A Whopper, all right? And instead, we're going to charge him three dollars for a Whopper because they're better dressed. Or in the drive-thru, that person's driving a... 2006 Scion XB with the back window bashed out, all right, we'll only charge them, you know, 50 cents for fries. Ooh, this person pulled up in a brand new Lexus, we'll charge them $3 for fries, all right? 
It's the interesting thing, and this is sort of the dark side of all this information gathering, all the profiling and, and all that that they can do online. Um, I believe they stopped doing this practice after it became exposed because that's kind of bad publicity, but who's to say that they're the only one that does it and maybe they're just the only one that got caught. So if you think about it, um, the point made was very true. I could look at, a, 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 an organization could do something like this. You know, we all have heard about the, like the cost of living index. It's more expensive to live in New York than it is in Ohio, you know, and so on. A, a company could go in and look at your location and uh, prorate the price. Gee, this person lives in Cleveland, we'll charge X amount. This person lives in New York, we'll charge X times 1.5 or something like that. So it's scary, all the stuff that can be going on here, all right? Uh, the, the conclusion of the book was, not the conclusion, but the conclusion for this sec section of the book is, the server knows more about you than you know about it, all right, than you know about what it's doing. Yes? Oh, no, I was just Yeah, yeah, so, so that's scary stuff in a way. All right, and again, you know, this is something I could go on a long time about. One of the problems I think in social media relates to the server looking and deciding what news stories you see and what search results you have. So without arguing politics, if you have gone and liked a lot of right-wing pages, you're going to get right-wing positive stories. If you've gone and liked a lot of left-wing pages, you're going to get a lot of left-wing. So what does that do? Does that allow you to take an open mind and maybe acknowledge that, gee, maybe the other side has some valid points? No. It more firmly pushes you in the direction that you're already heading, preaching to the converted. So you see a lot of updates. Why? Because the server, and I'm not even, I'm not even attributing any malicious intent to the server. It's not like the person at Facebook is twirling their mustache saying, oh, ho, ho, we're going to get these people. They think they're doing you a favor by saying, I'll give this person news stories that they like. All right? And by doing that, well, they're largely preaching to the converted. And you're not seeing reasonable diverging opinions that might cause you to re-examine your own opinions. So. Again, that's sort of an insidious thing of all this data collection that, uh, that goes on. Um, even something as innocent as like the music that you like, you know? You go, to, you go to Pandora or any of those things that gather information about you, what songs you like and all that. They're just delivering more of the stuff that you've said you liked, all right? And on the surface, hey, that's a good thing. but. A lot of people like to periodically discover new music, all right? Something that they might not have realized that they like. And this model of giving you more of what you like has a potential to prevent you from discovering anything new. All right. So again, this isn't, uh, you, you know, your question about uh, relativity and all that may, you know, it's getting me thinking in this direction, you know, uh, that, that, that there are social impacts of this as well. You know, it's not just, you know, us technology people tend to be very uh, um, welcoming and, and take a utopian view of, of all this technology, but there's a downside of it as well. And, and we sort of have to be aware of that if we can, um, you know, if we, have, if we stand any chance of, uh, of uh, addressing some of the side effects. Anyhow, on to ASP.net. So what we're going to focus on is how the magic happens here in ASP.NET. This, as I said, is a generic diagram. This, these server-side scripts could be PHP, ASP, whatever, and the process in general works the same. How does ASP.NET work? Well, first of all, let's precisely define some terms. ASP.NET C 
Sharp Visual Studio. Now, you may know these terms already, but I want to talk about them to make sure that we really understand we're all on the same page going forward. Can someone give a definition of ASP.NET? Now I really do need a drink. I should have taken one. Compiled web page. Compiled web page. ASP.NET pages do do that, but I'm talking about just in general ASP.NET. It's a framework. Framework. Great word. Framework, and I'll add to that for developing web applications. And again, I'm, I'm distinguishing between web applications and websites that applications do more, have more functionality. What do I mean when I say a framework? What do you think of when you think of framework? Something that's already there for you just to you have to use? Something that's there that you can build upon. A starting point. All right? Components that you can use to make something. All right. You know, let's say you're going to build a cabinet. All right. You could, I don't know if you could, I know I couldn't. You could go into the forest and chop down trees and take those trees and somehow turn boards out of them, and then take those, mine some coal and other stuff, <coughs> make some nails out of iron, or whatever you make nails out of, and you could do the same thing and make a hammer, and then you could piece together a house, all right? Yeah, you could. <laughs> you know, someone did it that way ages ago, or something like that, but instead, you have a certain starting point when you build a house, or, or a cabinet, let's say. You go to the hardware store and buy some nails and a hammer. You go and you buy some wood at a, a lumber yard, and so on. You have a starting point. And the idea is that starting point sort of gets rid of some of the mundane, typical tasks that everyone doing the kind of thing you do is going to need. So a person is building a cabinet will need these tools. A person that is building a spice rack will need these tools. Maybe a person that's building an addition to their house will need these tools, and so on. So all the people that are involved in the kind of thing that you're, you're in are going to find these things, these components, if you will, as a great starting point for their own efforts. And then they don't have to worry about chopping down trees and making boards and mining coal and all that kind of stuff. They just need to worry about making their cabinet from this starting point. All right? In a nutshell, that's what ASP.NET is. ASP.NET is a set of components that provide you a framework or a starting point for developing web applications. <coughs> and we'll talk about those components today. We'll look at some of those components today. And... Uh, and see how they are beneficial in uh, performing, um, performing the kinds of activities that, that you typically would do um, on a website or web application. What is C Sharp? It's, it's a programming language. How does C Sharp work with the ASP.NET framework? certain components. 
components on it. But I might want to make those components act in a certain way that isn't part of their nature, isn't part of what they do by default. So therefore, I can write code to do that. All right? So there might, for example, be an ASP.NET component for a text box. All right? There might be an ASP.NET component for a password box. All right? That's all well and good. And you can put those on the page, and they'll do some things for you. All right? But the process of taking that user ID and password and <coughs> looking it up in the database and if it's okay, do one thing. If it's not okay, do something else. And maybe count how many tries the person has. And if they have more than three uh, mistakes, then lock them out of their account or whatever. All that is manipulation of those components. It's doing something with those components. It's using those components to do some job. So the C sharp, if you will, brings those components to life and allows you to do stuff with those components. And it is a programming language. Is it the only programming language that you can use with ASP.NET? No. No. What's the other main one? JavaScript. VB. VB. Oh, yeah. not, not JavaScript, but VB. Right, VB.NET. Um, so you could, you could use VB.NET. It's the same components, right? It's just a different kind of glue, different language that you can use to manipulate that. And from what I understand, there's ways to set up other languages. Those are sort of the two that you get for free, Microsoft's two. All right. Finally, what is Visual Studio? It's integrated Development Environment. An integrative, Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. What does that mean? Drag and drop. No. <laughs> Drag and drop? That, that's, that's a part of it. It allows you to develop your... Websites um, without having to write like assembly code. <laughs> yeah, it, it allows you, uh, it's a tool that makes the writing, makes the creation of these components and the use of these components and the use of the C sharp language a little easier for you. And we'll see how it does that. All right, so it's sort of your helper as a developer. All right, it sort of keeps track of things for you, helps you find problems. Um, helps you out uh, with suggestions about what you want to do, and so on. Would you have to use an IDE to develop an ASP.NET web application? No. You could literally, through Notepad, go in and create all the files that you needed for an ASP.NET application. All right? The thing is, though, is, yeah, we could do that, but what is the benefit? Do we want to? No. All right. And the reason for that is that the ASP.NET framework is so complex and so invo involved that you need something to sort of help you out with that. All right. You need a, you need an assistant. It, it would kind of be a a large uh, large task, and you'd be spending a lot of time spinning your wheels doing stuff that someone also someone else already figured out how to do. Uh, and those lines. So, if you know me, if you've had me for any classes, if you had me for HTML, if you've had me for Java, I'm not big on IDEs, all right? I'm not big on IDEs. We typically do any editing in just a normal text editor. And the reason for that is I like you to understand it on that nuts and bolts level. But I relent a little bit here. I'm getting soft in my old age, I guess. And I will say, yeah, let's use Visual Studio. Because again, the framework is so complicated um, that, that, that the help uh, that you get from it is good. All right, that's kind of an overview of those terms. Every web page, or let, let's look at an ASP.NET application. At the very minimum, you're going to have a web config file in your application folder. You're going to have a web config file and at least one page. And by default, the home page will be called ASP, uh, default.aspx. 
you will also have a second file that's related that ends in a .cs extension that is what is called the code behind. Keep in mind, this is a specific way we are going to be developing web applications. There are variations on this theme. We have our web form, we have our code behind. In actuality, you can combine those two. You can combine the code behind into the web form, but I don't like that, so we won't do it. I, I believe there's an example in the textbook where it does that, but we're not going to do that. All right, so... Keep in mind when I make statements like this, I would be here six hours if I put every disclaimer and qualification on the statement. So if I say every page has that, well, it doesn't have to, but yeah, the way we're going to do it, yeah, is it has to. <laughs> All right. The web config file contains information about the app. And when we start out, there's really not going to be much into in, in that. And as we get further in the course, there's going to be more and more stuff that goes in that web config file. We'll then have each page. It's a default.aspx file. <coughs> All right. And there'll be more things that we'll talk about later. There'll be more folders and 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 other stuff that we'll talk about later, but we can leave this for now. This is sort of a minimum. We can also have, as part of this, we can have CSS file, JavaScript file, images, maybe in an images folder, and so on. All right, let's look at these files, or let's talk about these files, and we'll actually look at them. All right? The ASPX file is going to be sort of an HTML file. So anything you can put in an HTML file, you can put in an ASPX file. But you can also add ASP.NET controls. Why can we why do we put ASP.NET controls? Because we can write code easily for those controls. And we can do that in our .cs file, our code behind file. Any of you that have had me for other classes knows that um, I, I talk a lot about separating stuff into components. All right. In my web development class, for example, I talk about there being the HTML and there being CSS. We're separating the content of the web page with the appearance of the web page. Here we're taking that step a little bit further. This is the content of the web page. Style is still the appearance of the web page. But lastly, we have this .cs file, which is server-side behavior associated with that page. And as we know from talking about CSS and HTML, or in my Java uh, class, talk about different classes, and in my Android class, talking about the uh, layout files versus the code files and all that, the advantage of separating is that you then have simpler components all right. You know where to look to find something, and ultimately it leads to better maintainability. If everything is mixed all into one big sort of mess, then it becomes harder to maintain. All right, and a change of you effect in one place, 
you might have to affect redundantly in other places as well. This also has the advantage from a project management standpoint is if I have someone who's really sharp with graphic design and HTML skills, I could pretty easily teach them how to make great ASPX pages. And the flip side, if I had someone who was a whiz coder but really didn't have the graphic design skills, I could sort of have them work as a team and have the one person do this and have the one person do that. And on some projects, that's how it works. All right. Um, in other cases, you know, you're wearing both hats and you're doing both of those. So it really depends just on the nature of the project. I'm trying to think if I have any other things to say at this point. Oh, yes, I do. One thing to keep in mind, and I'll repeat this over and over and over again, is that after the server processes the request and uses these files, what gets delivered to the client is a plain old HTML file. All right, so whatever I have as far as in the ASPX page or in the code behind page, whatever I have in those, the server does its thing with them, does whatever coding I have and, and renders the ASP.NET controls. The output that is sent to the browser is an HTML file. All right. What I'd like to do is go through the process of creating a web app. We did that last time. And let's create using a, a simple ASP.NET control that I think illustrates some of these points. All right. And then we'll, we'll go from there on to onto the next uh, task. user interface design to go sideways I scroll down in Windows 8. Here's Visual Studio firing it up. Again I'm going to talk about the way that I find the simplest and most effective for creating these things for this class. Um, if you've had C sharp you might have learned other ways to create a project whatever. This way is the simplest, most straightforward, less, least number of problems. So I'll start Visual Studio. I'll go up here. Yeah, I was going to say, and become his, hypnotized by the green thing going across. Create new website. I can choose where to put it. I'm going to, for the first few exercises at least, create an empty website. That's with only the web config file. And I'm going to be sure to pick Visual C Sharp for this website. So an empty site. Visual C Sharp, and I'm going to browse, I'm going to put the folder on the desktop, and I'll call it Thursday. Click open, yep. and I can click OK, and sure to its word, it creates a website called Thursday. That folder is on the desktop. 
Inside that folder are actually two files. I sort of lied when I said there's only one. There's a web config and a web debug config. All right. One thing I would strongly urge you to do is to um, show ex file extensions. And I, I make that suggestion to all web development classes because you want to know precisely what a file is named. Here with the extensions hidden, it just says that that file is called <coughs> web and web debug, whereas I know it's a configuration file. So I'll go here and then I'll go here and then I'll go here because I don't know Windows 8. And there we go. And I will click off or I will click on, rather, file name extensions. And now I can see the actual full name of the file, web config and web debug config. All right. So this is my application folder. That's what you need to turn in. Zip up that folder and everything in it when you're ready to turn it in. All right. So I'll go here and say file, new file. And I'm going to create a web form. And the nice thing is, is by default, it chooses the name of default.aspx, which is what we want our first page to be named anyhow. So since this particular example is only going to have one page, that's OK. We can just leave it at that. So I pick default, and I click Add. All right. We have, again, three views of this. We have the plain old source code view. We have the source code view. We have the graphic design view, which is the drag and drop. And finally, we have the split view, which is a little bit of both. Um, it's OK to use a drag and drop, but you should also be aware of the code that it's generating precisely. Nothing gets my goat. My goat's been missing for a few years now because it's been gotten a few times. But nothing gets my goat more than someone saying, Visual Studio did this. It's like, oh, is Visual Studio enrolled in this class? Is Visual Studio going to get the grade? Is You are making these web pages. You are using this as a tool. The old saying, something like it's a poor carpenter that blames a hammer or something like that, is your responsibility to know about the code that it generates. And therefore, even if you use drag and drop, that's fine. But know what the code is. Look at the code. And that's why, yeah, and then when we get the code behind, uh, that will become even more important. But the idea is that if you know the code, then you'll be in a position to fix things. If not, then stuff is going to just seem like a mystery to you. Like, why did it do that? I don't know. It just did it. All right? Whereas if you can look at the code, you have a fighting chance of being able to figure out what's going wrong. So we have these three different things. So it's okay to use drag and drop, but be familiar with the code too. And we'll probably flip between these modes just to demonstrate them and look at them and so on. I have over here a toolbar, which I can pin. And these are a list of all the ASP.NET components. Some of these components have a one-to-one -one correspondence to their HTML tag, to an HTML tag. For example, hyperlink. If I go and drag a hyperlink here,
first of all, is this an HTML tag? No. There's no HTML tag that is ASP colon hyperlink. What is it? Well, it's not C Sharp. It's an ASP.NET component. We can use C Sharp to do something with that later on. But right now, this is an ASP.NET component. Now, what does that mean when the user requests this page and the server does its thing? It's going to translate this ASP.NET control that sort of looks like an HTML tag, but it's going to translate it into actual HTML that the user, the client, can use in the browser. Now, the question that you might ask is, why do that? Why not just make a plain old link? I could do that, right? I could just type in a href equals http What's the difference between doing this way and doing it this way? Well, when you do it the first way, you give yourself more options to do things with that link on the server side. Exactly. When you use the ASP.NET control, you have more options to do things via server-side coding. So, if I had a choice of which one to do, I would look and say, am I ever going to need to do server-side coding with this? And if the answer is no, I'd probably just make an HTML link. All right. If the answer is yes, I might need to look at what the user's preference was for default search engine or whatever. Then I might make an ASP.NET uh, control. <coughs> let's run this and let's look at the results that I get. So I can go click <coughs> run. I can choose which browser to view this in. Maybe. Of course not. I didn't think so. I just wanted no, to make sure no. before I... Which one do you think I recommend? Do what? Which one do you think I do recommend? All of them. All of them. Exactly. All of the above. Yeah. That's, that's the advantage of having taught the, some of the same students at the same time. It's like a day like today where I'm like really tired and I feel really wore out. They can do some of my lecture for me. All right. All right. Now look at this. Here's a link. Here's a link. If I view source... Keep in mind, I'm viewing now from the client's perspective. I have two links. The one I coded, the one which started its life off as an ASP.NET control, but when the server did its thing on it and delivered it to the client, it got translated to a, a tag. All right. So now it has an idea, you can make it pink or something. <laughs> well, now it has an ID, yeah. And, and more importantly than that, because I could have put an ID on my link that I coded, so I could make that one pink. But more importantly, I have a little more options of what to do on the server side with it. So I could write server side code a little better. I could actually write server side code on the other one as well, on a, just a plain HTML tag, but it's a little more work. All right. That's valuable if you are uh, like converting a website that was a static HTML page to something dynamic. All right. In this case, the ASP.NET control translated to one HTML instruction, one-to-one. -one. A hyperlink translates to an A tag. All right. Let's look at another example that probably more vividly shows some of the advantages here. Let's, let's get rid of these, and let's put a calendar control. Again, there's no HTML tag called ASP Calendar. ASP Calendar is an ASP.NET control that when the user requests this page, the server is going to process 
that control. And what do I mean by process? Well, one of the things it's going to do is it's going to take that single ASP.NET control and translate it into the corresponding HTML tags to form a calendar. What do you think HTML tags are going to be created here? What, what's the HTML going to look like when I run this? It's going, it's going to be a table with how many columns? Seven and how many rows? Yeah, four or five or six, depending on which specific month. Can you have a six row weeks in a month? Probably. Yeah. If, if, if the first was a Sunday, then you'd have four weeks. That would take you to the 29th. No, you probably could only have yeah you yeah then you could have you could have six I think. If the first was a Saturday maybe. Yeah, if the first was a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, depending the on. Sundays at the beginning. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so let's run this and let's see what happens. Now, when I click run, by the way, I'm simulating a user requesting that page. All right. So in other words, the server is delivering it. Built into the Visual Studio um, IDE, there's sort of what's called a development web server. So if you notice, there's a URL here that says localhost, which means your local machine's web server, on a certain port, this is your development web server. And again, August 2014. If I view the source on this and view the HTML that got delivered, delivered I'm going to notice all kinds of stuff. Imagine if you had the code up by hand. Imagine if you had the code that by hand. Could we do that? Yes. Every one of you could do that. I have confidence. Maybe not today, but with a little practice and all that, you could do this by hand. But the point is, is there's all of us, there's every other web developer in the world, and there's a good chance that there's going to be a lot of web pages that need calendars on them, right? It's like, if you think about it for a calendar, you know, we're not the only people that might want a calendar on our website. A lot of people will. That's the idea of a framework. A lot of people want to build cabinets and spice racks and room additions and things that require rectangular pieces of wood. All right, so there's lumber yards where you can go and get those components already made so you don't have to trudge into the forest and chop down your own trees and make the boards. All right, same idea here. A lot of web developers want to have calendars on their website. So it's not a question of whether they could or couldn't do it. It's a question of why should they spend their time working on something that is very generic across the board. Spend your time instead on the things that are distinct to your application. Now, actually, there is a little more to this than just plain old HTML. There are snippets of JavaScript, too. So, for example, what I can do is I can click on this and go forward a month or go backward a month. Are the days links as well? They are, but... Since it has no idea what you want to do when you click on them, you'd have to code that sort of behavior in. So let's say if you had some kind of event planned. If you had some event or something, you'd have to code something to go and do something with that. Correct. Keep in mind, you know, you're buying lumber here. All right. Um, it would be great if you went and you bought wood that automatically assembled itself into a cabinet, but you got to do you got to do some of the work because you know the lumberyard doesn't know what you're buying the wood for. In addition to the house or a new garage or a cabinet, so it gets you so far, you take it to finish it up. I have a question mm -hmm. when you were saying that that server and the address is that provided by. Visual Studio. That, yeah, that is, a, that is a functionality of Visual Studio. Visual Studio contains a, what's called a development web server. Now, if you notice, just like HTML tags have properties, right? With the link tag, you have the href property, and with the <coughs> um, image tag, you have the source property, and all those things, or attributes, rather. These ASP.NET control has its own set of attributes or properties that we can set. 
So for example, title format. I can have it simply be the month instead of the month year. Next month, text. Right now is a greater than sign for that little arrow. I could make it say next and previous. I could do other things as well. As far as formatting it. But we'll leave that. Oh, first day of the week. I could make it Monday. If I make it default, what does it use? Well, for us it will use Sunday, but where does it get that? It gets that from some... Windows property uh, that exists on the server. So if there is some sort of cultural um, convention, whereas the first day of the week is considered not Sunday, but Monday, then you could say, if you pick the default, it would be based on the server's settings. I'll pick Monday, because I always think of Monday as being the first day of the week. Can you use this portion or the uh, portion that actually shows it to you Change, um, to change its placement on the web page? Yeah, that's a great question. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. All right. So let's run this and let's see how it looks a little bit different now. Notice it says previous and next. I changed that. And I don't recall what else I changed. Oh, I made the first day of the week Monday instead of the default. And, yeah, it just says a month instead of a month year. So I can customize these things through the attributes. All right? So, again, that's just like I can, I can give additional information about an HTML tag, I can, I can customize or give additional information about the ASP.NET controls through its property. Now, the question was about positionings, positioning, the, positioning these things. And... What do you suppose the answer is? How am I ultimately going to position this? I would think through CSS. Right? You think through CSS and you're absolutely right. Why? Well, because CSS is the language on the web that's used for the visual layout and the visual appearance of it. Well, how am I going to get CSS on this? Well, there's a couple ways. There's a couple ways to do that. This is where it helps to look at the HTML that gets generated. Essentially what you do is you look at the HTML that gets generated, then you sort of decide if I was styling this, if this was static HTML that I wrote, how would I style this? So, let's look at the HTML. That calendar is a table so I could write style rules for a table, right, and it would work. It has an ID of calendar one, so I could write style rules for things that have an ID of calendar one. It also, if I look at one of the properties, one of the properties here is a CSS class. So I could assign a CSS class to it and then write style rules for that. Whenever, you're, whenever the question is, is, how do I style something, you got to know, like, the hooks. What are the main ways that we style things? Based on HTML tag, based on ID, based on class. If you can hook on to one of those things, then you can style it. So let's go and do that. And we might try a couple different ways to do that. So let's go and create a CSS file. I'll go to File, New, File. Style sheet, and I'll call it just style sheet. I click add. There you go. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say table. Why? Because it's a table, so I can write a style rule based on table for it. 
How do I know that? Because I peeked at the HTML. I know the end result that it's coming up with. Yes. Sorry, this is early, but did it, did it already tag this CSS sheet in your HTML file? No. So you still have to write. Still have to go and do that because again, there's a potential for you to have multiple CSS files. So I'll go and do this, and I'll put table. I'll put a background color of. Something eyesore-ish. Yellow. And I will put a margin of 100 pixels or 200 pixels just to make sure that it's not in the corner. Now, as was asked, does it define that as part of this web page? No, because it has no idea. Um, which style sheet you want to use. You've created a style sheet. You might not want to use it on this page. You might have created it for some other page. Can you use multiple style sheets anyways? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll go in here and I'll create my link to the style sheet. Yeah, you could. Yeah. That's pretty cool, though. I mean, IntelliSense picked it up. Yep. And it also picks up the fact that I have a style sheet called style sheet. Nice. Unfortunately, he also thinks I might want to use the web config file for the style sheet, which isn't so smart. So maybe this should be like semi IntelliSense. <laughs> or I could use a page to be its own style sheet. So, yeah. Okay. So now, let's go and run it. First of all, let's look at design view. Oh, and there that's we awesome. go. And ooh, that, that looks ugly. That's really nice. <laughs> I'd give it a B. Yeah, I'd give it Maybe I have two more weeks to retry. There you go. And let's run it and, oh, that, that doesn't look so good. Let's try getting rid of, ah, I, I know what the issue is. It's putting a margin on everything. Let's go and change that. Well, we could change that a couple different ways. Let's go and put it, instead of everything in there, let's go and put the style on the ID. I think it was called Calendar 1. Yeah, then with a capital C. Yes. All right, there we go. There we go. All right, and now we have it that way. So the question of how to apply style stuff, which is a great question, is you have to know how you would do it if you were doing it with static HTML. Once you know how to do it with static HTML, you got to sort of like reverse engineer and say, okay, what are the hooks? What are the ways that I have that I can hook my style onto that ASP.NET control? And again, you have the HTML tag, you have the class, because you can assign a class to any ASP.NET control, and you have the ID. Now, that is my preferred answer. The other way you'll see people doing it sometime is you can actually go in and set some of the properties right on the ASP.NET control. Like I could say, I could assign a background color here. And I don't like that. Why don't I like that? Because then you have to maintain it. Because then you have to maintain it. And if I had calendars on five different pages and I wanted them all to look the same, I would have to go to five different pages. This is back to using like a font tag, all right, effectively, or, or using HTML. So you don't forget all the good stuff that you learned in CISS 216. You know, occasionally people say something to the effect of like, gee, I learned all that HTML, now I'm not writing HTML exclusively. Well, you are. You're still writing HTML, but you're also writing code that writes HTML. All right? And again, notice that, yeah, notice that um, a good part of this document is just plain old HTML. This particular document only has one thing that's an ASP.NET control, and that's a calendar. And that gets translated. All right. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to close out of this and show you how you come back to work on this again tomorrow.
let's say, let's say if we weren't quite done with this. So I'll close it. All right. And I will go into Visual Studio again. I'll go up to File, Open, Website. So I went File, New Website to create it. I'll do File, Open, Website. Point to my web page. Let me rephrase that. Point to my application folder. What do I mean by the application folder? I mean the folder that contains the ASP.NET, the web config file. All right. How do I know that? Well, in this case, it doesn't show me any folders underneath. But you have to be careful. Occasionally, students will run into problem because they don't drill deep enough. If, for example, let me, let me show you what I mean. Let's say I have Let's say I have a folder called MZ, and I go to File, Open, Website, and I browse, and I click there, that's not going to work well, all right? You open it up, and oh yeah, there's my pages, but if I go to run it, something bad's going to happen. Okay. All right. Doesn't do exactly what I want to. And again, depending on specifically what your application consists of, it could get even uglier than that. All right. So instead, you'll go <coughs> file open website and you'll pick the exact file the file or, or the exact folder the folder that contains the web config file and open that and then you're ready to roll now when you're done with an assignment you need to zip up the whole folder don't send me the files individually zip up the whole folder And that'll be the one that you'll send to me. Questions about this? Uh, with regards to uh, when you opened uh, a, new, uh, a new page, uh, I wanted to ask about that little box in the lower right hand corner. Okay. We were leaving that uh, unchecked. Which box was it? Uh, for the file new uh, web form. Okay. But what did the box say? Uh, use master page? Uh, code in a separate... Code in a separate file is checked. Oh, okay. Yeah, it should be checked. Um, the master page thing will be unchecked for at least now. Later on, we'll be using the master pages. Other questions? Alrighty, we'll see you over in lab.